All right. Well, this week our community prayer gathering is going to be actually at also Riverwood Covenant Church. So every week there are people from um, these seven churches and really throughout the community that gather to pray on Thursdays from 7 to 8 a.m. So I hope you will come and join us this week. We will be at Riverwood. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, would you open them to, uh, with me to the Old Testament book of Ruth? If you need a Bible, just raise your hands. There are some guys coming by right now. They'd love to hand you a copy. Ruth is the eighth book in the Old Testament. We'll get there in just a moment. Have you ever sat in a place of pain and as you looked at where you were sitting there was no obvious way out of that pain have you ever found yourself sitting in a place of pain and when you looked around trying to find just a hint of hope a glimmer of hope that that, that light at the end of the tunnel all you see is more pain. You know, when we are in that place, you can find yourself just emotionally stuck. You can find yourself emotionally paralyzed. Asking the question, what, what do I do? Where do I go? Who, who do I turn to? Over the last couple weeks, we have been looking at the pain of a woman named Naomi. As we have been looking at the book of Ruth, and the book of Ruth begins with Naomi and her family facing a famine in the land of Israel. And so they flee Israel to the land of Moab and they leave all that was familiar to them. And shortly after getting to Moab, Naomi's husband dies. And later on, as they remained in Moab, her two sons, her two married sons, die. Now she is an older, widowed woman living in a foreign land, wondering how she is going to provide for herself and these two young widows. And as she sits in this place of pain, all she can see is pain. You know, we might not be able to relate to Naomi's specific situation of losing a husband, losing two sons, and living far away from our home, but I can imagine that we can all relate to being in a place in which you're thinking, God, I am stuck. And God, I don't know how I got here. And God, I don't know what to do. And God, when I look around, all I see is pain. You know, one of the themes of the book of Ruth is that God is always at work, even in our places of deep pain. That God is always at work, even when we walk away from God, and even when it seems like God has walked away from us. And we sit in those places of pain, and as we sit in those places of pain, asking the question, I have no idea how to get out of this. I have no idea how to respond to this. The book of Ruth is reminding us that God is still God. And He's still good, and He's still sovereign, and He's still gracious, and He's still drawing us back to Him as He accomplishes His purposes in our life. Today, as we focus on chapter 2, we are going to see God's faithfulness in a woman that is in pain. Last week, we saw that after the death of her two sons, Naomi leaves the foreign land of Moab. She sets out to return to her homeland of Israel, and one of her daughters, Orpah, decides to return back to her home. But as we saw last week, the other daughter-in-law, it says, the scripture says, clung to Naomi and makes this statement. I'm going to go wherever you go. And your God will be my God and your people will be my people. And where you die, I will die. And scripture says that Ruth realizes, or Naomi realizes, this woman isn't going anywhere. And so they both return home. And so read with me Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. 
So, so the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? And the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem, and verse 19 says the whole town was shaken. They were stirred. Everyone is talking about them. And since it's been 10 years, and those 10 years were hard years and difficult years and challenging years, Naomi now reflects a woman who has been through hard and difficult times. And the women of the town are asking the question, is this Naomi? And more candidly, they're saying, what happened to you? You don't look like the Naomi that left here. That's what pain and tragedy and affliction can do to us. And not only does it shape us emotionally and spiritually, but those challenges can take a toll on us physically. And so Naomi responds, don't, don't call me Naomi. The word Naomi means pleasant is the idea of something being enjoyable, something being satisfying, something being good. In the last 10 years of her life, she is saying, have been very unpleasant. It has been very unenjoyable. Our, the last 10 years have been full of dissatisfaction. This is a decade not of peace and blessing or comfort. She says, don't call me Pleasant, because right now there's nothing about my life that is pleasant. Instead, she says, I have a new name. It's Mara, which means bitter. She says, I, I, I'm a woman right now who's bitter. And I have, I'm, I'm a woman right now who's experienced the bitterness and the harshness of life. She says, when you think of me, and when you call out to me, don't call out as a woman who is pleasant. Call out to me as a woman who is bitter. You know, what's interesting about Naomi's statement is that she connects her bitterness to the Lord. In fact, in her response in verses 20 through 21, she references the Lord four times. I'm going to read this statement again. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Morrow, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? That even in her pain and even in her bitterness, she hasn't become an atheist. And she hasn't turned and served other gods hoping that they will give her life. Even in her bitterness and her pain, she's still living in a worldview in which the Lord of Israel is sovereign over all things. She's still living in a worldview in which God gives and God takes away, God blesses and God disciplines. And her references to God here are not just general references to God. Not just saying the big guy upstairs has dealt me a difficult hand, but she refers to God in a very personal way. Twice she uses the word Lord, Lord meaning, meaning Jehovah, the self-existing God, the eternal God, the one true God. She's acknowledging something about who the God of Israel is. And then she uses the word almighty twice, which is El Shaddai, meaning the one who is sovereign, the one who provides. And so she says, the one true God who is sovereign, the one true God who provides, he's testified against me. I think it's a significant statement Naomi makes, even in her bitterness. She may not understand what God is doing. She may think, God, you are unfair in how you are dealing with me. 
she may have a wrong understanding uh, about how God is to interact with his people and she may not in this moment be being willing to examine her own heart and, and, and that this may be a place of discipline that she has before God but she does recognize this this is the hand of God you know when we go through things in life that are painful God doesn't mind us wrestling with him in very candid and blunt ways. God doesn't mind us bringing the hard questions before him. God doesn't mind us saying the words that David says in Psalm 13, in which he says, God, have you forgotten me? He doesn't mind those questions. But when we wrestle with the hard stuff of life, he wants us to wrestle with those things in light of who he is as creator and who we are as creation. That when we wrestle with life and we wrestle with death and we wrestle with joy and we wrestle with pain, may we wrestle with those things with the one who gives life and the one who gives death, the one who allows joy and the one who allows pain, because God is using all of those things in our life to accomplish his purposes in our life. The challenge is when pain causes us to run from God, and we start to seek answers and hope and life outside of God. It's in those moments that we miss out on what God is trying to accomplish in our life. We miss out on what God is doing in us and through us, even in that pain. And I might say, especially in that pain. You know, it's interesting, when we wrestle with the one who is truth, that's where we find truth. When we wrestle with the one who is love, that's where we know and find true love. You know... The hard part is it's not always easy to distinguish between the discipline of God when God is simply allowing us to experience trials to the maturity of our faith and simply the wickedness of this world and the consequences that we experience living in a wicked world. Because normally all three of those bring some form of suffering or affliction into our lives. But all those things, as we walk through those different areas, allow us to recognize the sovereignty of God, the never-ending work of God. No, Naomi recognizes the work of God. That's a good thing. Uh, but right now, she doesn't see the goodness of God in that work. And as we see in the rest of this book, this hand of affliction that Naomi is experiencing is for her good. And it's for her daughter-in-law, Ruth's good. It's for Israel's good. And ultimately, we're going to see it's for our good. Well, as we continue in chapter 2, we're, we're going to see God's provision for Naomi and Ruth. And, and, and in chapter 2, we, we get to see two significant things. Well, we're going to see when God often reveals His provision and comfort. We're, we're going to see when He does that in our life. And then we're going to see how He often provides provision and comfort. And so let's continue in Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, that's Naomi's husband, who passed away, whose name was Boaz. So right here at the beginning of chapter 2, a man named Boaz is introduced to us, and, and he's described as a worthy man, meaning he is an influential man in that community. He's a prominent man in that community. The, the King James Version says he's a wealthy man. Verse 1 gives us this introduction of Boaz because Boaz's life is about to intersect with Ruth's life. And so with this information, we continue in verse 2. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Naomi and Ruth come to Bethlehem and they are women in need. 
They, they don't just return to a nice house with a job waiting for them. And Naomi may be looking for family and friends to take care of her, right? We, we, we don't know what, her, what she's thinking, but, but she's coming back because this is the only place that she knows where to go. And, and as we're going to see in this chapter, God is going to provide for them. But what's interesting is that God's provision and His comfort doesn't come before He allows Ruth to step out in obedience while still in a place of pain. Ruth's made a commitment before God that Ruth is going to stay with her mother-in-law. Ruth has made a commitment, wherever you go, I will go. In other words, I am going to care for you, be with you. Wherever you die, I am going to be there with you. They're going to have to bury me next to you because I will remain with you. And so when they arrive in Bethlehem and they have nothing, what does Ruth do? She says, let me go to the field that I may gather some food for us. Maybe the Lord will show favor to us. She responds in the next step. What do I do? Well, I need to walk in obedience to God. You know, when we're in seasons of pain, we can become paralyzed. And we can find ourselves not doing anything. We can find ourselves just simply angry at God that He doesn't pick us up out of this pit, out of this pain. But maybe it's that God has given us an opportunity to walk by faith while in that pain. God's given us an opportunity to walk in obedience to Him while we are in that place of pain. This is the first thing that I want us to see in this chapter, that God often begins to reveal His provision and comfort as we walk in obedience to Him. You may be in a place right now of pain, and you're wondering, God, why don't I see you moving in my life? God, I don't get it. All I see is pain. I don't see anything out of this. And God may be giving you the opportunity to ask the question, okay, God, what is my place of obedience before you? Okay, God, what is my place of walking in faith before you? It could be as simple and ordinary as what God was leading Ruth to do, go and provide for yourself and your mother-in-law. You know, too often we're looking for God to move in some extraordinary way when He's simply asking you to walk by faith in a very ordinary way. Verse 3 says, She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. You know, by using the phrase happened, the, the author isn't simply saying Ruth doesn't know anything or isn't saying this is happening by chance. The author is saying Ruth doesn't know anything about Boaz and Boaz's connection to the family. But, but the author isn't saying that this was, this was just good luck. It wasn't saying this is chance. Because one of the themes of this book is that God is continually to be faithful to work out His plan even when it doesn't seem like He is at work. Out of all the fields that Ruth could have gone to, God leads her to the field owned by Boaz, who oh, happens to be a relative of Elimelech, which is going to become a very significant part of this story. You know, she wasn't going to happen upon this field staying at home. She wasn't going to happen upon this field sitting in the fetal position at home saying, God, why don't you remove this pain in my life? She happened upon this field when she was taking the next step of obedience. God, what do you want me to do? And so while Ruth is walking by faith, she happened upon the field that God was leading her to. You know, if you're stuck in a place right now, whether it's in a place of pain or you just feel stuck, May your prayer be, God, what is my place of obedience right now? God, God what is it that, that you're calling me to walk by faith in? Verse 4 continues, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered, The Lord bless you. 
Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. And Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? When you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Verse 4, Boaz enters the picture. And while he was in, initially introduced as a man of influence, a man of significance, a man of wealth, we now also see that he's a man of character. He is a man who has a heart for God and for people. First, how does he respond to the workers in his field? He, he, he says, may the Lord be with you. He gives a blessing over them. And how did the workers respond to him? That they didn't say, oh, there's Boaz, that rich guy. Well, he doesn't have to work. No, they, they respond, oh, may the Lord bless you too. There's a relationship they have with this man. But now there's someone that Boaz doesn't know as he looks out among the workers. And he doesn't just say, hey, who's that woman? But what does he say? Whose young woman is this? Why that question? Well, he's asking, is there a father who is caring for this woman? Is there a husband who is protecting this woman? And when he learns her story, and he learns that she doesn't have anyone providing for her, or caring for her, in fact, that she is the provider for her mother-in-law, he steps in as provider. When Boaz addresses her as my daughter, he is stepping into her life as one who is an older man caring now for a younger widowed woman who doesn't have anyone to guard her and provide for her and protect her. You see, in this culture, a young widowed woman, a foreigner living in a foreign land was now incredibly vulnerable. And so he addresses her as a protector, as, as one who is going to care for her and provide for her. While I believe he is displaying compassion for someone who needs compassion, he also reveals that his motivation is to be a blessing to Ruth because of her faithfulness to God and her faithfulness to Naomi. Continue reading with me in verse 10. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother in your native land and come to a people that you did not know before? The Lord repay you for what you have done and the full reward be given by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here, eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. Such a wonderful picture of this man saying, I am going to protect someone who needs protecting. I'm going to provide for someone who needs providing. Boaz sees a woman who has sacrificially cared for her mother-in-law, and he, in turn, makes the commitment to provide for Ruth. Boaz is recognizing that he gets to play a role in God blessing this woman for her faithfulness. You know, in chapter 1, we, we, we saw the consequences when we walk by sight, when we make decisions out of our own wisdom, and the devastation that comes when, when we leave the protection of God. But now Ruth, in chapter 2, is a woman who is walking by faith. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. I'm in it with you, Naomi. And now we're seeing the blessings of faith. 
And that blessing is coming from someone who is making themselves available to be a blessing. So here's the second thing that I want us to see. That God often uses others in our life to be his provision and comfort. Which means what? Well, it also means that God wants to use us in our lives to be his provision and his comfort. My grandfather would often say to his kids and to us as grandkids, whenever we were leaving our time with him, he would always say this, Jeffrey, be a blessing. And it wasn't just a cliche statement. It wasn't just some casual thing that he picked up some point in church. But for my grandfather, as our family knew, it had great meaning behind it. It was the idea that as you go out, Jeffrey... That that you look for ways that God can use you to be a blessing in their life for his purposes and for his glory. It's the idea that you live every day saying, God, I know you are at work and I want to be a part of your work to accomplish your purposes in the everyday people that you bring into my life. I still hear his voice in my life. Jeffrey, be a blessing. I believe we see in Boaz a man who desires to be used by God to be the blessing of God in other people's lives. We see it as he interacts with just the workers in his field. As he blesses them, they respond the same way. I want to be a blessing to you also, Boaz. We see it as he speaks blessing over Ruth. Oh, because of your faithfulness, may the Lord bless you, comfort you, provide for you. And what I love about the story of Boaz here in chapter 2 is he doesn't just say, I hope God blesses you, but he recognizes that he gets to be an instrument of that blessing. This is how I'm going to walk into your life in a very intentional way. This is the means that I have that I can give to you, and I want you to be blessed by that. He provides for her in a very purposeful way, giving her instructions on on stay close to my my women. I have instructed my men and anyone not to hurt you, not to harm you. And by the way, eat with me and drink of our water. God's blessings to Ruth come through another person. You know, Boaz could have easily missed this moment. Boaz could have just been a guy thinking about himself, thinking about his field, thinking about his crop, thinking about how much money he is going to make this season. And he could have simply ignored or missed the opportunity that God had set before him. But I believe that Boaz was living his life through the lens of the outward heart of others allowing him to freely enter into the work of God when it presents itself in just an everyday moment. Let's check on this field. Let's see how they are doing. Not knowing that this was going to be, in this ordinary moment, the extraordinary work of God. Not only to be a blessing to this woman, a woman who would eventually become his wife, but they're going to see through their lineage, King David, the Messiah, and salvation. An ordinary moment. He could have easily missed. I think Boaz was living life through the outward lens of how the Almighty God wants to be at work in his life. May that be our prayer every day, that we have eyes to see the ordinary moments that God is wanting to do something extraordinary. May may, may our prayer be, God, today, may I have an opportunity to proclaim the hope of the gospel that Jesus is Lord. That he alone is the way, the truth, and life. God, would you give me that moment today? Would you give me the moment to comfort someone who needs comforting? To provide for someone who needs provision? God, let me live each day through the outward lens of the gospel. Verse 17 takes us to the end of this passage. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, and then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went to the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. 
So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi, Naomi said to her dead daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all the harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, lest in, in any other field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Ruth experienced the blessing of Boaz, and now Naomi is experiencing the blessing of Boaz. You know, in chapter 1, all Naomi could see, and maybe all Ruth could see, was the discipline of God. All that they had experienced at this point was the harshness that life can offer. And too often, when you and I go through a chapter 1 season in our life, we are ready to give up without the full story unfolding, without recognizing what God may be doing. You may be a Ruth, you may be a Naomi right now in a chapter one season of life in which all you know is pain and all you know is bitterness and you're sitting in that place and you cannot see chapter two. But please know that chapter one may not be your whole story. That God may be using that pain and that bitterness to lead you into a chapter two. But as we walk through the chapter ones of our life, may our question always be, God, what is my place of obedience? What is my place of walking by faith before you? Chapter 2 shows us that God often works and moves and comforts and provides as we walk by faith. Chapter 2 also tells us that the way God provides in comfort is often through the provision and the blessing of others. If you are in a chapter 1 season, would you walk by faith before God? And if you are living a life of Boaz and it's been a season of blessing, may you recognize the people who are in places of pain and bitterness in those everyday moments of life in which you need to walk into their life as a blessing, as a comfort, as God's provision to them. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. And as they come on up, would you allow me just to pray in response to what we have read and heard today? Father in heaven, we thank you that there are chapter twos. We, we, we all know the chapter ones of life. We, we know the chapters that lead us to a place of bitterness, that lead us to a place, place of pain, that lead us to a place to say, God, have you forgotten me? And chapter twos remind us, no. He has not. He is at work in the pain to accomplishing his purposes in our life. God, as I stand in this room, I know that there are seasons, lots of different seasons that cover this room. And I ask that wherever we are, whether it is in a season of pain or season of blessing, that our response would always be, what is my place of obedience before you, God? Where is it, how is it that I walk by faith before you? May that be the question that we are asking and then may we hear and listen and respond. We thank you, God, that you are good and merciful and kind and that while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die for us. God, we thank you that our hope is not rooted in us, it's rooted in you. And God, let us walk every day in a place of hope because of that. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.